Ori McDermott from the UK, from Nottingham University, and myself, Rosemary Dreus from VU University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Next slide, please. Oh. I suppose the green one. No. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, um, the, this thing stands for Dementia, Intersectorial Strategy for Training and Innov Innovation Network for Current Technology. Uh, it's a Marie Sklodowska Curie Innovative Training Network. This means that people do get training, but at the same time they do also research projects. And the overall objectives of this thing are to develop a multidisciplinary intersectorial educational research framework for Europe uh, to improve the lives of people with dementia and the carers through technology. So they're all technology projects for people with dementia. And to provide the evidence to show how technology can improve the social health. So that's the specific focus, social health, and uh, of people with dementia. And what do we mean with social health? Well, besides physical health and mental health, there's also social health. And social health is composed of, let's say, three domains. The capacity to fulfill your potential in society and your obligations. Uh, I heard that just one of the ESRs went uh, to vote for, <laughs> for Denmark for your, uh, yeah, your, uh, how do you call it? General elections. General elections, yeah. So you fulfilled your obligations today. <laughs> uh, the next domain is ability to manage life with some independence. And then the third domain is uh, social participation. And so the distinct project is uh, divided, the research uh, packages, work package three, four, and five um, into three topics uh, based on this social health concept. The first is technology to fulfill one's potential and obligations. The second, technology to manage one's own life. And the third, technology to enable uh, participation. And on the left you see how many researchers are working in these different work packages. Um, and we also have three cross-cutting aims, objectives, um, and it is determining the practical cognitive and social factors to improve usability of technology, so more than one project is working on that also. And the second cross-cutting objective is evaluating the effectiveness of all kinds of interventions, technology which are used. And the third one is identify conditions for successful implementation. So let's say research on adoption, scale up, spread, sustainability of technology in daily life, dementia care and society. So on a micro, meso and macro level. Uh, so that about distinct. Uh, today, 13 early stage researchers are going to present uh, a short pitch on their work, what they did, and maybe main findings, maybe preliminary findings, but not all, not, not all projects are finished yet. And they are divided into three groups. The first group is uh, app and web-based interventions. The second is about app and web-based interventions as well, I see. <laughs> but the next group, and then uh, one about robots and assistive technology. Um, for those who are online, I can't see you, hello. Um, yeah, you can, you can of course ask questions if you have them and you can write them down in the chat, <laughs> then we can see them here and they can be uh, posed to the, the presenters. We will do it now in three groups and Ori will pr uh, present or introduce the groups. And the presenters are invited to give that talk here. To be honest, um, this symposium has really been organized by ESRs themselves. So we got three different domains, but actually you reorganized yourselves, right? So the first group is actually, as Rosemary said, app and web-based. So I would just, without too much in introduction, I would like to invite Esther, Gianna, Leslie, Gornatz, and David, the prompt.
So first the presenter is Esther, and it's going to be on the young onset dementia. Okay, yes, yeah, so I will pitch my, can you hear me? Okay, so I will pitch my project on online peer support for people with young onset dementia, and my supervisors are Professor Martin Oral and Dr. Ori McDermott. Okay, so first, why should we actually look at online peer support? Um, well, at the moment, um, access to age-appropriate local peer support in the UK varies widely. Um, some areas have excellent support, and some areas have hardly anything at all. And people also call it kind of a postcode lottery. So depending where you live, you either have good local services or not really. Um, and secondly, traveling long distances to age-appropriate peer support groups is not possible for everyone. Um, this could be due to dementia symptoms, or the groups are at a time of the day when people are still working, um, or people just don't have the resources to travel very far. And finally, um, there are still misconceptions about peer support groups. In our research, we found that um, many people with young ones have dementia also believe that groups are more for older people with dementia, that it's about singing songs from the time of the war, and um, on top of that, there's also the fear of stigma. So online peer support could offer a solution as there is no need to travel um, and people can join from the comfort of their own home. Um, I'm not pressing the button, right? Do I have to point the middle. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'm um, sorry about that. So how um, can we make online peer support more visible? Well, first of all, organizations should clearly advertise that online peer support is an option for the people with young onset dementia, as many people are not aware of this. Um, so they should advertise it in healthcare practices and in that way raise awareness. Um, and secondly, health and social care professionals should um, clearly signpost people that online peer support is an option and signpost to relevant organizations as well. So how can online peer support be improved? Um, well, first of all, facilitators and moderators should um, have clear communication and organizational skills, so provide guidance on how to use the platform, um, send out timely reminders, be available for support, but they also should have soft skills, so get to know um, members before they join the group, um, get to know their needs, check in on people if they face any difficulties during the meeting, and finally, um, to ensure that the group is a safe space for everyone. So yeah, these were the main findings of, of my project. Hello everyone, this is Golna Zatefi. I'm a fourth year PhD student based in Maastricht. My supervisory team are uh, Professor <laughs> Marlene de Bucht, Professor Franz Verhey, Dr. Rosa, uh, Rosalie van Kniepenberg, and Dr. Sarah Bartels. Um, so today I'm going to uh, present an overview of my uh, study where we are approaching the topic, in the topic of psychosocial interventions, and we approach the uh, topic from three different dimensions, content, implementation, and design. So we conducted a systematic review to see how acceptance and commitment therapy as a transdiagnostic and theory-guided approach work for informal caregivers of people with dementia. It appeared to be um, acceptable and feasible, however, uh, efficacy varied from study to study. Uh, Implementation-wise, my colleague, uh, Dr. Hannah Christie and I um, had a qualitative interviews with uh, experts of the field to see how uh, better e-health uh, interventions in dementia can uh, find their ways in uh, implementation. Um, and um, in terms of design, uh, right now we are uh, conducting a feasibility study aiming at maximizing the, um, the potential of acceptance and commitment therapy for informal caregivers of people with dementia through a blended uh, intervention. However, the efficacy of uh, our study might not be generalizable as this is a, a feasibility single arm uh, trial. To conclude and recommend, um, psychosocial interventions from every dimension we approached it um, has shown promising results um, uh, uh, in the context of informal care. Um, Content-wise, there is a still a need uh, for a, a mechanism of change, how acceptance and commitment therapy can uh, actually work for informal caregivers. Implementation-wise, um, there, there might be still a need uh, for either a checklist or a, gui a guideline 
to, uh, to further highlight the importance of inclusivity and um, scalability of uh, e-health interventions in the context of dementia from very early stage. And in terms of design, there, there is a need uh, for more effectiveness and controlled trial uh, to, to see how actually acceptance and commitment therapy uh, influ uh, affect, um, uh, how's the effectiveness of uh, acceptance and commitment therapy for informal caregivers of people with dementia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So we're going to now move to our group two. Okay. So. be a pleasure to invite Maurizio, Fanny, Pascal, and Josephine's going to be online. That's going to be a challenge. I hope I'm the first one. Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mauricio Molinario Latte. I am from Costa Rica and a PhD student, a PhD student in University of Salamanca in Spain. Um, so currently in Spain, it's been affected by a demographic uh, situation that is called the empty Spain, which basically refers to a rural urban migration, especially of the young people, which increase aging in rural areas and, for instance, increase the risk of dementia in these areas. Um, and also it's been decreased the amount of health healthcare services offered in these areas. So especially in the reg region of Castilla y León, where I'm doing my project, so uh, we basically aim to build a bridge um, to give access to rural areas to um, monitor assessment and psychosocial interventions for people with dementia. Uh, and we conducted two systematic reviews, one to um, get the assessments in uh, integrated care approach uh, that is comprehensive geriatric assessments. Uh, and we basically recommend the inter long-term care and home care assessments um, to use. And we also look for the digital health interventions that are being used to uh, assess uh, or use the comprehensive geriatric assessments and get the data easier. So with this assessment, you can get the health status profile picture of a person. And this is under construction, so we basically want to have two views one of for the health professionals that get all the data so they can then uh, suggest a psychosocial intervention and then the family member or even the person with dementia get the notification of what psychosocial intervention to use and at the moment uh, we are working uh, we already culturally adapt the i support which is a, a training and support program uh, developed by who uh, we adapted and co-designed an online eye support platform for Spain um, with people living with dementia, informal caregivers, experts on technology and dementia, and a rural population sample. And we expect to have some preliminary effectiveness uh, information on dementia knowledge and caregiver burden. So I hope to let you know more about the project in the future. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Fanny Monet. I'm a PhD student at the End of Life Care Research Group um, in Brussels in Belgium, uh, where I work under the supervision of uh, Lieve van den Bloch and Lara Pivodic. Um, and so we're working on a project about the development of an advanced care planning website for and with people with dementia and their families. Um, so first of all, before I go into the tech side and the development process, what is advanced care planning? Uh, it's really a process that allows people to uh, discuss their preferences uh, for future care uh, and medical treatments. Um, and it's really something that uh, encourages people to discuss their wishes for the future, uh, what matters most uh, with their families and with uh, healthcare providers. And this can include uh, also appointing a proxy decision maker or uh, documenting their preferences uh, in advanced directives. And so uh, to support people in doing that, we decided to develop a website. Uh, and our first step was to do a user needs assessment uh, where we first uh, did a systematic review uh, of existing advanced care planning website and tools that already exist, 
We also had a look at dementia uh, associations and what advanced care planning uh, content they have on their websites. Um, and then we also talked with people themselves, with focus groups, uh, with family carers and healthcare professionals, as well as consul consultations with the European Working Group of People with Dementia. <coughs> Um, and so uh, once we had all this data from our user needs assessment, uh, our first step was to summarize it all into a concept for our website. Um, and then uh, with the involvement of an advisory group and testing participants for our usability testing, we tested our website in four uh, iterations. So we tested four prototypes where each um, each time we added a part of the website uh, until we had our final website. And so in the end, we have a website uh, where we provide information about advanced care planning, um, yeah, um, what it is, uh, but also a glossary of um, difficult or jargon words that are involved in the topic. Uh, we provide tips for communicating about advanced care planning with family carers, with people with dementia, and also with health care, health care professionals. Uh, we give uh, access to videos and to two interactive tools that help to reflect about advanced care planning. And overall, our process uh, really allowed us to get relevant and valuable feedback from people with dementia and their family caregivers about the website. Um, it allowed us to identify missing content and techno technological issues. Um, and in the end, we have a result of uh, a website that's seen as user-friendly and relevant, and that's uh, ready for larger scale evaluation. So stay tuned for our results, which will be coming next year. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pascal Heinz. I'm uh, working at the University of Maastricht at the Alzheimer's Center in Limburg. Uh, my supervisors are Professor uh, Franz Verhey and Professor Marjolein de Wicht. And my uh, project focuses on <laughs> social participation of people with mild dementia living at home. And could maybe a mobile application help with that? Um, so what we did we do in our project? First, we wanted to know what is already known about technologies for social participation for older adults, including people with dementia, and what are their effects? So we included 36 studies uh, of various designs, but most of them were done in a small scale. Um, and what we saw is that they had actually limited effects on loneliness, social isolation, and social support. Uh, quantitatively, but we also saw in qualitative studies, for example, that uh, technology had actually a good impact on social connectedness. But only three of these uh, studies focused on people living with dementia, and also um, social participation was measured and defined very differently. So that's why we wanted to know uh, what do people with dementia actually uh, think about social participation? What are their experiences? And what are maybe uh, barriers or facilitators they uh, experience in their daily life? That's why we conducted semi-structured face-to-face uh, -face interviews with people living with dementia in the community um, and their informal caregivers. And what we saw was that there was some kind of decrease in social participation or maybe I should say change because some activities uh, they couldn't do anymore because of dementia, but there were also new ad activities added in their social participation. Um, but there were also barriers reported in that. We are still in the very beginning of analysis. But for example, uh, there were not, some of them were not able to drive anymore, which makes it uh, more difficult to go somewhere uh, outside home to meet people, for example. Uh, now we want to know, could maybe a mobile application help with that? Um, that's why we uh, will ev evaluate the feasibility of Viamigo, which is developed by a university in Belgium, University of Hasselt. And the aim of the app is to support independent out-of-home mobility of the user, but also uh, to reduce caregiver burden of the user. Uh, and while it's... Uh, 
uh, originally developed for people with intellectual disabilities, we want to know, could this be also something for people with dementia living at home? So the question is, is this intervention feasible for people living with dementia? Um, and what do they think about it? Um, so we will uh, test this. this. We will start up <laughs> hopefully soon um, with 24 people living with dementia and they're part of their informal caregivers uh, living in the community. We will, uh, yeah, they will use the app for three months and then we will see uh, what they think of it. Um, yeah, I think the interesting thing was how complex social participation is. Um, and that, yeah, still research has to be done to define it, actually. Um, that still stigma plays a role in, uh, in uh, dementia, a big role, actually. And that while there are great things already done, there has to be more done, actually. Um, and, yeah, I will update you about the results of the feasibility trial uh, next year, hopefully. <laughs> Any questions from, yes? Yeah, um, although I've enjoyed the presentations, I, I'm quite sad by the lack of ambition in terms of technology for people with dementia. I have dementia. My house is totally controlled by AI, everything from when I get up in the morning till I go to bed at night. So we're already doing more than you're, you're researching. Why is that? I think maybe David can give an answer to this because a lot of people are using technology, but also a lot of people are not using technology and we would like to support those people. Say something about your experiences with Find My Apps. Uh, yeah, um, I think one of the things that we uh, hear about is a digital divide, and I think we see that there are some people who are very comfortable using all kinds of technology, uh, in, up to and including the, the most cutting-edge AI technologies for controlling their homes. But then there's another group who uh, has absolutely no familiarity with things that we all take for granted. Smartphones, tablets, apps, things like that. Um, I, you, if you look at trends over time, that group will be getting smaller and the group that people like yourself who are very comfortable with technology will be getting bigger. And that's great. Uh, but in the meantime, I think it's really, it would be very unfair to leave behind uh, the group of people who are not currently making good use of technology. So one of the things that we're particularly uh, interested in is what we can do to support the people who are not currently comfortable using all of those technologies. So it's a question of adoption and implementation as much as discovering you know, new, new technologies. That's, that's not what I mean. Uh, during the pandemic, everybody disappeared. And people with dementia, like myself, had to find our own way. And we started teaching ourselves how to use technology. We don't stop learning because we get dementia. Our, our capacity to learn is still there. We started helping others put AI into their homes. People in their 80s and some of them even older. So I think your argument is, is not what I mean. It's more about, let's be ambitious. Let's take technology to the next level. Let's not stay here. It's a positive message, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. OK, we go on now with the next group. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to invite the next group, Jaroslav, Aysan, Simona, and Billis. And we are starting with Jaroslav. Should I press the button? 
in the middle, the green one. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Yaroslav. I'm from Czech Republic. And my project is about developing a pet bot, a low-cost smart companion. Um, since the project is quite complex, I, of course, I collaborate with other researchers. Uh, first of all, my supervisor, Olga. Then uh, Philip. Uh, we, we are coming from Czech Technical University. And then uh, Alžbeta and Iva Holmerová, and they are from uh, Charles University. And since the project is quite complex and uh, the work on it is beyond the initial scope, we have established a university spin-off company to further conduct the research and development, the distribution and the service of the system. And uh, the name of the company is IT for Humanity. Um, I think the best way to express the, the current uh, or the latest results, or at least the snippet of them, is to play a video. And if you got more questions, I'm free, uh, free to answer. And I have another presentation, a similar presentation, uh, tomorrow at 14.15. So let's play it. Yes. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Aysan Mahmoudi from uh, the University of Salamanca, based in Spain. Uh, my project is uh, centered on a social robot whose, uh, whose name is Mini and uh, is designed to assist and accompany elderly people uh, living with dementia and those with uh, mild cognitive impairments in their private homes and uh, those living, uh, living in um, uh, residential care facilities. 
the robot is able to communicate to human through verbal and non-verbal uh, interactions uh, and uh, to stimulate a series of uh, cognitive and uh, psychosocial functions through the applications and uh, games. Uh, so we wanted to trace the potential facilitators and barriers to implementing the robot in the meeting centers in the Netherlands and Spain. Um, we conducted a qualitative uh, study based on interviews with the stakeholders uh, in the um, social and care organizations uh, and meeting centers, the managers and the staff. Uh, we also uh, did uh, some focus group uh, with uh, people with dementia, the users of the meeting centers. Uh, the uh, interview questions were based on uh, the MRC guidance to um, process evaluation and the theoretical uh, model of uh, Franco Mayland um, to uh, trace the potential facilitators and barriers uh, in preconditions, preparation and execution phases in three um, uh, micro, meso, and uh, macro levels. Uh, so after the uh, data analysis, um, uh, we identified um, uh, some potential facilitators as uh, human resources, funding, the impact of uh, mini uh, on the users and uh, in the meeting centers program, uh, as well as characteristics uh, of the robotic uh, intervention um, and collaboration with other organizations. We, we also identified uh, some impeding factors like uh, the physical context uh, and functionalities of their mini robot, uh, the user context and uh, the activity policies of the meeting centers. So, uh, this study provided uh, an insight um, for those who are considering the, uh, the, the implementation of mini robot in the meeting centers. And uh, it also will assist uh, the developers of mini, mini robot to modify its characteristics and features and tailor them to the needs and preferences of uh, the people with dementia. Uh, as well as the activity policies and settings of the meeting centers, which will contribute to uh, a successful adoption and implementation of the robot. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, well done. Congratulations to all of you for this tremendous achievement over the past three years. I was... Uh, I had the honor to be involved to some extent, so under the circumstance of those very difficult years conducting research as an early stage researcher. First of all, congratulations to all of you, not just to the three sitting here. Um, and in a similar regard, the question that I have is for all of you. I wonder what you actually take home from this experience, because the idea is, of course, you generate research output and it's all about technology and you can come to different conclusions about it, but it's also about the experience of networking across Europe and beyond Europe and I really wonder what the take home is for that, literally and maybe not quite so literally. Okay, maybe. Ah, Mauricio wants to say something about that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I want to answer because recently in a podcast that we recorded, uh, we, we commented about it. Um, I think uh, the most important thing of the, our group is that we come from different backgrounds. It's interesting because we are in different European countries, but we actually represent four different continents. Uh, so we give the perspective not only of European dementia, uh, it also it's Latin American, uh, Asia, Caribbean, yeah. and Asian. So together we can build like a lot of things and come with huge ideas from all over the perspective, not just. Um, developed countries, because, well, I come from Costa Rica, Leslie from Tinea and Tobacco, and I think dementia is seen very different, and what you're doing here in Europe, we probably cannot apply that in our countries in a way. So we can bring, or, or, or we can learn from the experience of Europe and bring it to our countries. Uh, so I think that's the most powerful thing of our group. Um, yeah, I don't know if someone wants to add to that. Um, yeah, just 
to briefly add to that, um, I think, um, like Maurizio mentioned, the culture and um, the professional backgrounds we come from plays a part, but uh, so I'm from Germany and now I'm now based in the UK and also seeing the differences within Europe, like how countries do it differently and um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to put into words, but um, I'm not too familiar with dementia care and research in Germany. I don't have a, um, a very good picture, to be honest. Um, uh, maybe someone can correct me, but um, yeah, I think it's also, you see that within Europe there are so many differences, and I think uh, conferences like these and collaborations are so important to uh, learn from each other and to um, apply what we learned in those countries. And you also studied in the Netherlands, so you know a lot about the Netherlands and the UK, but not about Germany. No, <laughs> Maybe go back then. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we go on now. Maybe there are other questions. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to conclude it with a few remarks. Yeah, in the end, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Joni, postdoc researcher from Belgium. Um, I agree with my colleague, it must be very exciting to be in an ITN um, when you are starting your as a researcher. So, and it's all wonderful what you've been doing. But I was just wondering, um, with regards to technology, if it's part of an academic project, you're always limited in time. And um, whether you guys have recommendations for sustainment of those technology interventions that you're developing. I will talk about that also later at the moment. But maybe someone, I'm going to say something about the best practice, of course, you know. But maybe you have something else to reply, you want to add? Yeah. Uh, thanks, that's a great question. So in my project, the roadmap that I'm building, it's specifically designed to be facilitated by occupational therapists. So I'm building it in collaboration with a tech company, but really I'm doing the first stage of building it, developing the manual to train the occupational therapist to deliver it, pilot testing that, and then there'll be a manual, a train the trainer manual, and the digital intervention, which will then be ready for feasibility testing. So this is why research takes so long to get into practice. But it, the idea is for it to be sustainable through a particular avenue of practice that already exists, where there's a lack of interventions that are digital and therefore far-reaching among people who already have the need for interventions at the early stage of dementia. If that helps. Yeah, maybe just one thing to add, and that is, um, I'm sorry. Um, and I think that is to include every stakeholder right from the beginning. So if you design a new intervention, don't think about implementation when you're towards the end of your project, but talk to organizations that can maybe carry your intervention forward um, after you're done with the PhD. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's what I want to say, that most of the ESRs already thought about the implementation aspects and developing toolkits, for instance, for in the end of the project. And, um, oh, there's another one now. Everyone wants to say what he has developed, of course. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say, since I tried to go after implementation and see what happens after the implementation process and, and sadly found out that they were not being used, the technology I came to study in Denmark, I couldn't find them actually in the beginning, it took a while. So I think uh, it's important, also it's more on a policy level, but to not only fund new technology coming into the nursing home, but also to fund re-implementation processes. I mean, Danish yeah. nursing homes all already have PARO, yeah. and it's lying around, and then we buy another pet robot, and then, so I think that would also be a solution. Okay, let's go on for the final comments, conclusions. Um, oh, this is from... Uh, <laughs> this is not mine. Okay, yeah, some concluding remarks. The distinct projects uh, provide more insight into factors that can improve the usability of technology for social health. So we focus on social health. 
and the effectiveness of technologies to improve the social health and some conditions for successful implementation. Um, overall, the projects contribute to knowledge on how technology can promote the social health of people with dementia. Um, yeah, and what was already said, of course, the, the findings are the result of successful collaborations uh, between the distinct consortium partners, but there are also non-academic partners and companies involved in distinct. And um, so that's, of course, and of also representatives of the different target groups. So it's a broad network we created around the, the real consortium partners. Um, I want to tell you something also about the best practice guidance because the recommendations coming out of all the projects, so we have 15 projects, 30 of, 13 of them have now presented today, but 15 projects with a lot of recommendations and they are integrated in the best practice guidance for human interaction with technology in dementia. And you can find that on the website of Induct, but also of Distinct. We started with this best practice guidance in a previous ITN, you know, the training network, Induct. But it is updated now, already last year, but now next in December again, with the recommendations of uh, this, this group of projects. And it will be updated again next year when all the projects are finished. So please have an eye on that. Um, you can find, you can download the, the, the paper version, but you can also, on the website, you can easily find all kinds of recommendations. Let's say if you are a designer, a technology designer, or are you a professional, or a person with dementia, you can type in the type of stakeholder you're interested in and then you get all the recommendations which are relevant for you. Of course, there's a lot of overlap also, but and you can uh, look in the three different areas of social health, but also in the, from the previous uh, Induct project, um, we had those cross-cutting uh, aims, and these are the same in distinct, so about practical cognitive and social factors to improve the usability, uh, evaluation of the effectiveness, you can look at effects, and also, uh, let's say, facilitators and barriers for implementation, if you want, are interested in that. So it's a very practical uh, best practice guidance, so please use it, and uh, don't try to invent the wheel again, you know. Uh, it's, it's really great if uh, people will use it. You can find it on www.dementiainduct.eu guidance. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your attention, but if you have any questions, we have still a few There's minutes, one, five minutes. Um, There's one question here. Yeah. Online, Some of you developed a website, others an app. On what grounds were these choices made? Were end users asked about it? We're not going to have time for 15 answers, but... No, we don't have time for 15 answers. Is any one of you want to say something about it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did uh, focus groups with people with dementia and carers and asked them that because um, when I started I was very keen on developing an app because that sounded so cool and everyone does it and then it's in the app store, you know. But um, people said to me, um, it depends on how much we want to use it and for, in my case, um, the information that we want to use um, or read through, we're not going to access it so many times so an app doesn't make sense if you have something um, that you'll only use a short period of time. So yeah, I think it's important to ask people that and um, yeah. So the, my, for my project, I've developed a web-based app. So it's a combination of a website and an app and a supervised training for the website. So it's very blended, it includes uh, unsupervised use of the application, as well as what normally would have been face-to-face -face training, but uses um, the remote technology as a benefit. Yeah, just to, not specifically about my project, but as a general comment, uh, one of the things that we've been, I think, very privileged with as a uh, distinct, you know, innovative training network across Europe is that we've been able to work really closely with um, the European Working Group of uh, people uh, with dementia. So we've all had the opportunity for sessions uh, at that level, but also within countries. So it's definitely 
been built into all of the decisions we've made, not just about whether an app or a website. Um, we've you know, worked as hard as we can to include the voices of people with dementia and their, their caregivers to shape the project. Maybe to add uh, for your own project, David, that uh, a previous PhD worked on that and talked with a lot of people with dementia and they said they would like uh, to use apps, but it was difficult to find them. <laughs> so that's why I find my apps uh, was developed, to find really apps which can be used by people with dementia and are practical for both managing your life but also for activities. And so, yeah, all, in all, all projects, I think uh, people with dementia were somehow involved to start up the idea and to, to develop it further. Um, no questions anymore? One final question. Ah, at the end. <laughs> Still three minutes. <laughs> I'm Adam Smith from UCL. Um, has there been any discussion with big, big tech firms? Because you can see how things like Find My Apps would be great if it became preloaded on a tablet, for example, or some of the things that the... That scary robot with the <laughs> demonic eyes. That, that, that one looks like it would be great because you could just put that straight into like an Alexa device, for example. <laughs> is, is there any kind of talk to the big tech companies about how they might pick this up? I don't know how... I don't know how big you want the big tech companies to be. If you mean the Googles and Apples, uh, I have to, to, although I was brandishing an iPad earlier, I have to say we're not sponsored by uh, Apple or Google. So I don't think any of us have had any direct contact with anyone that big. We have worked with industry as much as possible. Uh, that's also part of the idea of these innovative training networks. Is, so actually we all do secondments as part of our PhDs with companies as well uh, in industry. And that goes back to that question about implementation and sustainability and how do you keep things going. Uh, so, yeah, and as you heard, the robot is going to be sold by... Uh, the scary robot is going to be developed further by a company. Right, Yaroslav? Um, yes, hello. For, uh, thanks for, uh, for your comment. Uh, I mean, the, we're building it from scratch, so if somebody says, hey, the eyes are looking scary, uh, it's very easy to... I mean, uh, dismantle it and uh, I mean, put it, uh, put these uh, lights in the cheeks, for example, or somewhere else. I mean, it's you know, different, different people, different tastes. Somebody says it's it's cute. Somebody says it's scary. But it, that's that's the that's why we make it from scratch. It's very complicated work, especially where the the parts were missing during the COVID, and even automotive industry is missing parts. So definitely, we are missing. So we had to improvise a lot, and takes a lot of time to to develop it. But uh, in the end, it's adjustable system. So if it seems to be scary for someone, it can be changed pretty easily. We don't have a red, we have a pink and blue, blue for a smart home, and pink for petting. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, uh, I'd like to use the last minute to invite all ESRs forward here. <laughs> And to thank them all for all their great work in the last three years. It's their final symposium. Come <laughs> 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 Come on, go on. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's make a photo. <laughs> <laughs>